these discussions and some new faces as well. No. If you're ready to start. Excellent. 130% okay. battery. Uh, someone has the mic on. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, I believe we are ready to start, right? So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third session of this exciting Innovation Lab series on generative AI. For the past two weeks, we have been having these sessions to further understand generative AI, the LLMs and platforms available, as well as possibilities and restrictions regarding for this, uh, for many of us, right, new universe, which is generative AI. We, the innovation team, invited some bright minds to join us today. And in the session, we will explore the future of generative AI in Asia and the Pacific. To tell us more about the session, it is my pleasure to invite our dear colleague Flavia to give her opening remarks. Thank you, Caio. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here today and open this exciting third innovation lab on artificial intelligence. And this time with experts from the region. As you can imagine, AI is a critical topic for innovation at ESCAP, and it can literally influence every single aspect of our work. So it is no surprise that it's part of our innovation roadmap, as with AI, we can improve, for example, the efficiency of our processes, but also transform how we deliver on our mandate in the region. Of course, as we've seen in previous labs, we need to learn how to do that responsibly. Also, we need to talk about it across ESCAP, as we've done and we will be doing, so we can learn from each other. But it's also imperative that we learn from experts and leaders in the region who have been in the forefront implementing AI to solve pr pressing issues. With this, I also want to acknowledge the great collaboration to have this series uh, live between the innovation team and the several teams at ESCAP who are working on AI. So thank you, Tiziana and Vikas, as well as CKMS, but also to all innovation team colleagues that helped shape this session and Raphael, who's been really the mind behind this and leading and shaping every single session. So with this, I'm happy to give the floor to Caio, and I hope that this is, this is a beginning of a community of practice on AI at ESCAP to support the conversation internally and externally. Over to you, Caio. Thank you, Flavia. Indeed, this is going to be discussed very often, I think, among colleagues, right? <laughs> um, so today we have a diverse set of panelists to discuss how generative AI will be shaping the region and our work. We have with us Mr. Kasima Tampipichai, who is the head of AI strategy in SCB 10X, the innovation arm of Siam Commercial Bank. Uh, currently, his team is developing an open source large language model, LLM, optimized for Thai to address the language gaps in generative AI research, while also making AI more accessible and effective for Thai individuals. We have also Mr. Serge Stinkwich, who is the head of research at the UN University Institute in Macau, a think tank using a human-centered lens. Uh, he published critical insights on key issues around AI, shedding light on its potential for advancing the SDGs, enhancing accessibility, and promoting inclusivity in technological innovation. We also have Ms. Toshi Takahashi, who is a professor from the School of Culture, Media and Society and Institute for AI and Robotics in Waseda University, and an associate fellow of the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence in the University of Cambridge. She is an expert in the potential of robotics and AI for good, where human happiness is at the center. We also have Mr. Pratya Bukwan, a uh, researcher from NECTEC, the National Electronics and Computer Technology Center of Thailand. Uh, he's an expert in computational linguistics, natural language processing, and machine learning. And he's currently leading a team of researchers to develop the Thai-based la large language model. Uh, and to moderate the session, we have Rafael, innovation team member and project coordinator at the Innovation Enterprise and Investment Section uh, of TIID of ESCAP. Uh, he's currently the coordinator for the South-South and Triangular Collaboration Program on Science, Technology and Innovation among Cambodia, Lao PDR, Thailand and Vietnam, and leads the advisory support on policies to promote private sector engagement 
in STI. So without further ado, let's begin with the discussion. Rafael, please take it away. Thank you, Kyle. And uh, good afternoon, our colleagues. Very happy to be with you all here today in this last session. So today we have quite a packed session. We're going to look at generative AI today and some of the key policy issues that can help us on our future programs of work. And we also try to discuss some of the regional cooperation and partnerships necessary to leverage generative AI for, for good. And we finalize with a little Q&A in the end with 10 minutes. So we're starting with the first session. Uh, the first round will look on generative AI today and key policy issues. So to understand a little bit more about the current scenario and what should we be looking for in the coming years. Now, my first question goes to Kasima. Uh, so Kasima, in session one of this lab, I was given the task of explaining a little bit what is uh, generative AI, what is LLM. I'm not sure I've done a good job, but I promised colleagues that I'd be able to ask you then. So now, could you explain to us what are large language models? How are they developed? And how is your institution has to be uh, investing to create one? Over to you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Raphael. Um, very excited to be here. So large language models, we, we, we probably all have, have played around with them, but fundamentally from, from a very high level, they're ultimately next word predictors, right? We've created these big pieces of software that are these ultimately statistical machines that really predict the next word or to be more technical what we call them in the in in the space are tokens so the technical term for them um, and tokens can be words or letters um so so from a very uh sort of like high level historical view these statistical models language models have been around since the early 20th century um, of varying complexity and what we've done recently what really the first l in llm is that fast forward 100 years from when we started playing with the concepts of the la these language models um, we vastly increased the amount of complexity, the amount of computational power, the amount of data that we put into these into these uh, big software systems. Um, and we get these really interesting, ultimately what they are are emergent behaviors um, that we, we didn't really plan them out. They, they just sort of have been coming out with the scale of what we're doing. And so uh, so developing one of these models is actually from a from, um, uh, conceptual standpoint, very easy. It's like a, it's a very simple uh, process. I, I like to use the analogy of, of baking a cake, right? So um, you start with basically the architecture and that, that is kind of like the baking pan. Um, and so the architecture that everyone's familiar with now is something called transformers. That's the T in GPT, um, generative pre-trained transformer. Um, that was developed in 2017 by Google University of Toronto. And that's really allowed us to really scale up these language models. So that's really the, 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 the baking pan. Um, the next piece is you got to put the batter into it, right? So, so, you know, all kinds of ingredients. And for us, in this analogy, the batter is the data. Um, and so the data for these language models is really as much text as we can possibly get, right? And um, over time, if you look over the past, I think, since 2017, the scale of the amount of data um, that we've been putting into them has grown exponentially. So now we're at, at trillions of words, if you want to use that unit of measurement. And then finally, um, once you have the batter in the baking pan, you put it in the oven. And the oven is really the computation that's really needed. Um, and the computation is, in the world of, of AI training, it's really GPUs. And so all the stuff you've been hearing about GPUs and GPU shortages, um, that's the amount of computation we need. And you can measure computation in operations and amount of GPUs. But really, if we want to be really sort of honest about it, um, you can measure it in, in money. And so the amount of money we've been scaling into uh, into training these models at the scale that we've been we, we've been doing recently, um, we don't know exactly, but money is constantly flowing in, and and we've gone from you know hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands to millions. I think we're pushing into the tens and hundreds of millions of dollars um, to train these models. Uh, and so that's that's sort of what it takes. That's that's sort of what it is, and and what it takes to make one. So why is uh, SCP-10X, why is my team uh, building our open source model, uh, Typhoon? Well, I'll, I'll start with, with the fact that, that our scale is somewhat different. Uh, we're, we're not you know, spending this kind of, this, these kinds of resources, um, but our use case is also much narrower than a lot of these very advanced models. We're really focused um, on making models work well for the Thai market, that's, that's our goal. And the reason we're, we're doing that is SCP-10X and SVX is in the middle of a transformation to be a leading financial technology company. And um, 
like was like Flavia said earlier, we believe that AI is potentially the most transformative technology uh, in a generation. And the reason that our, our software is open source is we believe that so open source software is better software, especially for critical, important software like this. Um, the internet runs on open source and uh, open source software is more transparent, more secure, more trustworthy. Um, hmm. And finally, our roots are from the oldest bank in Thailand, which means we care very deeply about Thailand and Thai people and Thai culture. And so we believe this technology is important for the benefit of all Thais and ultimately to keep up with the development of the rest of the world. Thank you, Kasina. So it, it sounds like it's a lot of investment, but imagine the economic uh, potential benefit for that should also be quite massive as well. So if you can explain a little bit about that. And also, I mean, as you mentioned, the data and tax is such a core part of it. I imagine there must be some critical considerations regarding language and also the access to those LLMs that could impact inequality. So how are we perhaps heading towards a new uh, digital divide? Could you explain a little bit more about these policy issues? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, that's really kind of the core reason we decided to work on this. Um, some of the some of the divide issues or the inequality issues um, are 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 what I believe are some of the most important issues around this technology, which is why we're both investing resources in, into into this problem. Um, I certainly hope we're not headed to a new kind of divide, but the work that we're doing hopefully pushes against it. But but I am worried about it, right? So so um, to give to give this a little bit of context, I mean the most advanced models are all trained in English, uh, the ones that you've heard about, ChatGPT, Lama, Gemini, from all the big tech companies. The, the capabilities that we're most excited about, the most sophisticated capabilities of these language models that we've seen um, only actually work in English. Um, if you try to do it in another language, you're not gonna get the same level of sophistication. Um, also, these models are most accurate on English-based knowledge and culture. So if you ask GPT, even I, I believe in even ChatGPT 3.5, if you ask it the US national anthem, it nails it. ChatGPT 4 speaks Thai sufficiently well, but if you ask it the Thai national anthem, it, it just makes stuff up. It hallucinates like crazy. Um, and, and finally, because of the way these models work, um, they're most efficient and ultimately cheaper to run in English. And so um, to, to to best use these tools, you, you ultimately have to do it in English. And so um, the cost of developing these things means only the, 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 well, the economies that can afford to develop this tech will do it. So there's a lot of centralizing forces and it's, it's, it's concerning. And, and ultimately the economic return from this technology is, is potentially very unevenly spread throughout the world because of these centralizing forces, because some of the boundaries are on language. And this is fundamentally different from other transformative tech that we've seen recently, like web or mobile. Um, language models are inherently cultural, right? It, it, it's, it's about knowledge, it's about language, um, and all of that really implies culture. So, so using these tools that are important aren't necessarily just using tooling, right? It, it, they're importing so much more than that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, there, there, there's a potential for, I, I think there are forces that, to be concerned about. Um, but our team cares about these issues for Thailand, and I know a lot of other projects care about this, both locally and around the world. And so, um, you know, we, we ultimately just have to work on it, which is sometimes feels like, like we're pushing a boulder up a hill. Um, but, mm. but I think this is actually really important. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I think it's very good for us to have in this conversation, the Asia Pacific context, right? Where we can kind of like frame it in terms of the language. Good. Uh, so my next question now, I would like to ask for Pratia too. Uh, so... Kasima mentions about how they be working on it, but you as well been also be leading a team working on developing LLM. And that's more in the broader context of the Thai uh, AI strategy, right? So if you can discuss a little bit more, how is AI policy making in Thailand? Who are the stakeholders involved? What are the priorities? And where is like next tech fitting in? This? Thank you. Right. Um, thank you very much for having me in this program. Um, it's been my honor. And um, regarding the policy making in Thailand, it's always a challenge, believe it or not, um, especially for AI, because we are still lacking behind in terms of AI awareness and adoption. Um, so um, to get into that, let me um, elaborate more about the, um, the status of AI in Thailand. So back in 2023, um, we ran a poll for um, about 3,600 um, government agencies in Thailand and um, 600 of them replied. 
Um, so only 15%, believe it or not, 15% of them have adopted AI in their workflow. So the remaining are still working on it. 57% are developing their in-house AI workflows and 28% of them are still reluctant to adopt AI because they, they lack research uh, knowledge and also they need some, some more support from the government. So in 2022, Thailand, um, I, I mean, in Thailand, the, um, the cabinet of Thailand endorsed the Thailand national AI policy. Um, and um, this aim is to establish a throughout a AI ecosystem and leverage their economic competitive and people's life quality within 2027. So that's a very high aim. And um, so once we announced that AI policy, our government AI readiness index rose from 59 to 31 in one year. So that, that's a good progress. And regarding your question, there are five stakeholders in the ecosystem and they all have different priorities. Okay, let's start with the first one, the users. So um, we, um, let's say, we investigate their demands and we come up with the, um, the strategy to develop regulations, laws and standards and policies relevant to AI development and adoption in Thailand. So that's going to be general users. That's the first stakeholder. First. The scenes and abilities, and um, so we. But sure, maybe your connection is a little bit. Uh, these, like for example, large language model LLM, um, like Open Type GPT, and also mm -hmm. to develop AI in. I think your uh, connection is breaking a little bit. With high. So the, num the number 70. Okay. Uh, maybe you have another technical difficulty here. Um, the number sectors and I'm sorry. Oh, um, we might be having a little technical. Yeah, yeah. Maybe turn off the camera. Okay. Turn off a little bit. Okay, sure, sure. I'll turn off my camera. Okay, does it help? Yeah, okay. Help. So. Uh, I'm sorry for the signal. So um, the third type of stakeholders is developers. So we want to raise awareness in AI in every educational sector. And also we want to provide scholarship for research scholars and students. And for researchers and innovators, we want to leverage the AI development and adoption to prominent research fields and develop core AI technologies and encourage the research for AI service platforms. And the last one is the government and businesses. We want to promote AI adoption in government agencies and to promote AI adoption in target industry. Um, and also we want to promote the practical uses of AI um, and also to develop a driving mechanism and sandboxes for business innovations and AI startups. So that's basically an overview for the, um, the national AI policy in Thailand. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I think as, as you can see, this sort of like Things whether it's science, technology, innovation, there's so many stakeholders, right? So many priorities yes, to consider. That's true. It's very, very interesting how you put it there. So perhaps my next question more on the policy issues. What are some of the current debates in Thailand right now regarding AI policies? So now that people are raising awareness, uh, for instance, how are you balancing the need for one side regulatory safeguards to increase security, but without stifling innovation too much? How is the current debate there? That's a very good question. So we have been working very hard with the um, private sectors and also the AI researchers regarding the, um, the regulations. And um, so at the end of the day, we found a solution. We try not to introduce any hindrance or obstacles to the current AI ecosystem. So um, basically we have a, an, a small AI ecosystem in Thailand. So we, we don't want to prevent them from growing. So we don't put any hindrance or obstacles. And we also investigate um, the regulations. We found that the current laws and regulations cover all legal aspects in the AI ecosystem already. So that's already applicable. 
Hmm. The thing is, when we want when, when we talk about the regulations, we focus more on the intentions, actions, and results, and legal liability. So therefore, every aspect of the law has been covered. And um, so, what about the the policy? In the policy, we want to emphasize more on the ethical uses of AI instead. So we focus more on racial and religious profiling and biases in the AI models. So we want to prevent all of that. We want to also raise awareness about AI abuses and plagiarism. So that's the key thing. Also, we want to prevent at all costs the leaks of personal information and sensitive information. And we want to prevent spreading misinformation and propaganda by the AI. So that is issue. That is issue in every country. There may be, um, they may face the same thing. And also, we drafted and um, we established the Thailand AI ethics guideline to raise awareness for ethical uses of AI in practice. So um, it's going to be. Um, distributed to all of the sectors in Thailand. Not only that, we also focus on the government part. We set up the AI government clinic or AIGC to develop a govern governance framework for ethical uses of AI and also to give advice to government agencies looking forward to adopting AI in their workflow. So that is the uh, regulation so far. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's fascinating, right? Because when we research a lot about it, we tend to focus a lot on US and Europe. But it's good to hear that Thailand is also working quite active on this and has quite a sophisticated product uh, uh, yes. ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you so very much. Perhaps for the next session, thank you very much. And we will talk a, a bit in the next round too. But for my next question, I'd like to ask for Serge. So as someone as well from the United Nations University of Macau, so who's familiar with our UN framework, uh, can you explain a little bit more how can generative AI be utilized, perhaps, to tackle these complex and interdisciplinary issues such as the ones outlined by the SGDs? Can you talk about, about that? Uh, thank you. Thank you for SCAP for inviting me for to be part of this conversation, and thank you for this question on SDG. So, first of all, I, I just want to remind everyone that um, the, the sustainable development goals are badly off track and something needs to be done. And probably we can use AI to help us, but there are also at the same time lots of difficulties and issues. So, and in fact, achieving this agenda for 2020, 2030 can be seen as a wicked problem. So, what, what is a wicked problem? Is basically a problem where you have complex issues that resist conventional approaches to, to problem solving and for which existing solution might be sometimes worse than the original problem. So, it's a so you, we have to think about that. And I think, for example, uh, complex complexity, complex systems can help us to have a better understanding uh, because uh, uh, com complex system is composed of multiple heterogeneous parts that interact with each other to make a coherent organization. And maybe you can take the, the metaphor of a city where you have lots of uh, different actors that interact with each other and you have different environment at different scales and there are uh, uh, traffic flows and traffic jam, things like that. And so SDG can be considered as a complex system because all the goals are intimately, uh, interlinked and tangled. So for example, if you want to solve climate change, uh, this might be uh, have a consequence on social stability, for example, and because there are some maybe some constraints on the people who, who have to use less less their cars, for example. And we have already seen some example of this recently in the news. So if you add the digital transformation and the use of AI on top of that, you see that we we add another layer of complexity, and and uh, AI can be seen as a kind of solution for SDG for sure. But at the same time, comes uh, with um, yeah. If come back to this idea of a wicked problem, the solution might be worse than the the, the original problem. So, uh, I think one of the previous speaker uh, was talking about the amount of money infrastructures, computer infrastructure that uh, we need to run this and to train these large language models. And in fact, uh, this is also this money is also equivalent to the the amount of CO two that will be this infrastructure will generate and that will be uh, releasing the atmosphere. So it might have uh, this this big infrastructure, this computer infrastructure might have also a very big impact on the climate also. 
And it's very difficult right now to understand exactly this impact because there, you know that most of the tech companies, they don't want to disclosure their, their, this kind of information. But apparently, approximately, some people have made their, some, uh, they tried to, to come to do the, the math. And apparently, they're training a model like ChatGPT will need something like, you need something like uh, the equivalent of 600 flights between L London and New York just to train once yeah. there these kind of models. So you can see that this is a huge amount. Of, so especially you have to train these kind of models for, from time to time. And this is why we need, uh, a, I think this, there is a need for multidisciplinary approach to understand the impact of AI from multiple perspectives. And this is what we are trying to do inside our institute at, in, in, at the United Nations University in Macau. And I'm, I'm a computer scientist, but inside my research team, there are people with very different backgrounds, social scientists, uh, experts in communication or global health. So it's very important to have all these inputs to 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 have some kinds of uh, interesting solution at the end, and also we need to have a multi-stakeholders perspective and diversity inclusivity, uh, because these systems uh, will impact the people at the end. So it's very important to, and I think it was already mentioned in the, the context of the Thailand, but this is important for uh, the all people on the planet, especially people from marginalized population, especially people from the global south. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's a lot to, to consider, right? And we, we start with one technology, but we can see how many angles, how many dimensions they can be considered. So it, I think we're in the right track of bringing these different experts to this kind of discussion. Um, a next follow-up question I have to you, and this, so we discuss about data and text, but I think you've also been researching about synthetic data to train the AI models. Can you explain a little bit more about that? What are some of the challenges, opportunities of this synthetic data, perhaps, for this model? Yeah, our our research institute, in fact, is a research institute for the UN. So we are we are trying to understand. The, we are trying to predict a little bit the, the the future consequences of using this AI system. And uh, you know that all this AI system and the, especially the the generative AI system, they need a lots of uh, data to be trained. So some this is something like forty five terabytes of data for ChatGPT. And this is basically uh, data scrapped from the internet. And this is very difficult to obtain this data. And, and we are at the maximum because there is no more data available. So how we can do that? And synthetic data is a solution to address the, the problem of data uh, scarcity. And what is it exactly? So it's information that are uh, data that are created by computer simulation algorithm that reproduce some kinds of um, um, structural or statistical properties of the real world data. So it's completely synthetic from from the perspective that it doesn't represent real people or real uh, real things, and can be images, can be videos, can be texts, uh, and there are different kinds of approach to do that. I don't want to enter into much detail, but uh, you can use generative AI. And for example, the the Gartner Group they predict that in 2024, 60 percent of the data of AI system uh, that will be used to train the AI system will be synthetic data. And it was only 1% in 2021. So you see that there, there is a, a, lots of this uh, new data. And so what are the advantage? Uh, so not only you address the, the issues related to data availability, but also you, you can also maybe probably solve some of the privacy protection issues because you don't represent real people. So you can reduce the bias, the, the gender, the racial bias. Uh, you can... Uh, uh, maybe also reduce the, the the cost because you don't have to collect data, but uh, but but you will have some computational cost too. So it's uh, it's maybe not uh, that much uh, reduction. So you see a lots of benefits, but at the same time also new challenges, new risk because uh, the, you are not sure about the data quality and maybe because all this data generated by this ChatGPT large models, at the end, you will find this data on the internet and they will be used to train the new generation of AI yeah. systems. So you, so you see that there is this kind of vicious loop that uh, we will create and we probably there are people who project that the, the, the quality of the data will, will decrease and we will not be able to recognize what is the synthetic from the real data. It's a, so it's a, yeah, there are lots of interesting issues to, to consider. At the moment, yeah. So we have been working on that. We have been doing some recommendation, and you can find the, the recommendation that we have done on our website if you're interested. Oh, for sure, we should we should publish the the link in the chat later on. But very interesting this point, and I imagine that particularly for developing countries, it might have difficulties in have a, a high amount of data. That could be some interesting solution to be explored as well, perhaps. 
Uh, interesting point. Uh, and now looking at this part about the, the synthetic and how is perception like class professor Toshi. Uh, so now that we understand a bit more about what is generative AI, the different models and some of the considerations of technology itself. Could you explain to a bit more about what is the current sentiment in the Asia Pacific region regarding the AI adoption? So how do factors like age and cultural background can influence this kind of opinions? How is the adoption part of it? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much for your kind invitations. I'm greatly honored to join uh, this, uh, you know, wonderful event. Uh, could you show my slides, Rosa? Thank you. So next, please. OK, so um, AI has introduced a range of risks and opportunities and narratives surrounding the development of AI often seem to fall into a dichotomy between utopia and dystopia. And the extent to which narratives are utopian or dystopian seems to vary by culture. For example, with Japanese views in particular leaning more towards utopia and focusing on the potential social benefits of AI, especially to cater to a rapidly aging population. By analysis of AI images of Japanese media text in fiction, such as novels, manga, animation, TV drama, and we found a much more positive AI images with emotion, love, and mind helps and coexist with human rather than our enemies. By contrast, uh, European and other Western narratives exemplified by the image of the Terminator are typically dominated by fears, for example, that AI will drive mass unemployment and inequality. This is a part of our uh, project, uh, Global AI Narrative Project with the University of Cambridge. And, but I think uh, perspectives and attitudes towards AI depend on age and AI literacy, as well as culture and social context. So I'd like to briefly introduce two of my ongoing projects on youth and AI. So next, please. So the first one, a Future with AI project in collaboration with the United Nations. The aim of this project is to deliver global voices of children and young people to the UN and other stakeholders as a response to the new UN strategy number 11, listening to and work with youth. And we invited young people between the age of 10 and uh, 10 to 24, uh, Gen Z, to participate in surveys and imagination challenge. And the participants chose one of the following three challenges, AI for good, bad AI, and the future of work. And we received 254 completed surveys and 47 essays from participants from 33 different countries. And next, please. And as a result of survey, the perception of AI and robots is very positive among young people. So maybe young people could have more positive uh, than older ones. And next, please. And they'd like to use AI for simple tasks, such as in factories, making deliveries and houseworks and so on. And next, please. However, uh, they also feel that AI should not be used at all in the area of creating art and culture, potential decision making and care for both elderly people and children. And next, please. So in order to understand similarities and differences among uh, different cultures, I'm also leading Project Genzai, a cross-cultural research on young people and AI. And this is this project uh, initially started as cross-cultural research among US, UK and Japan in the Mushot R&D program in 2021 and has expanded its scope globally by including Chile, China, Singapore, Spain, Italy and Estonia since 2022. And Project Gendai aims to explore ways of moving towards a human-first AI future through the lens of Generation Z and it conducts cross-cultural research on attitudes towards AI, the need for AI and design of robots, and the future of work, AI literacy and AI fix, the risks of AI, and the future of AI society 2050. And next, please. So we conduct surveys among the US, UK, and Japan with over 6,000 young people, and we use the same questionnaires as a UN project. And the results show the same as the uh, UN project in general. 
However, uh, we found there are cultural differences between Japan and uh, the US and UK. In terms of caring for elderly people, nearly 70% accept AI in Japan, while in the UK and the US, human-based care was more desired. Nearly 70% think we should not use AI. So while Japan is generally positive about the introduction of AI, especially in caring for elderly people, there are strong cautions opinions in the UK and US of introducing AI robots in the medical and nursing fields. And I don't know about other Asian countries and because it's Jap specialist in Japan, but uh, uh, we also have uh, Chinese uh, colleagues and, and she has done a lot of uh, in-depth interviews. And then Chinese young people are also similar to Japanese, and they are very, very positive about uh, AI, especially generative AI, and expect to use for the QOL. So this is so far. Oh, thank you, Professor Toshi. Very interesting. I, I mean, when you saw the image of the, the Terminator with Astro Boy, as I mentioned, that was the first question I asked in the, the first session already. And our audience, I think, was 63% more favor Astro Boy. So perhaps they still have a more positive view of it. Uh, and also going now, looking at, as they mentioned, the importance of data as well, and uh, all these things that uh, might influence like language. So could you explain a bit about the policy issue? What are some of the societal transformations that we can kind of expect with this broad adoption and availability of generative AI? And as well, what initiatives are needed to prepare for those changes, particularly in media and digital literacy? So I mentioned it, a lot of uh, information, taking like misinformation around. Okay, great. Um, could you show another slide as well? So yeah, I can just talking that the chat GPT is uh, already being uh, used in many areas as we experience right now. And new opportunities of generative AI include uh, like improving work efficiency or reducing labor shortage and creating innovation. And about more than 40% of white color jobs will be replaced by AI. And for example, so ChatGPT can summarize internal text for business or translate them into a variety of languages according to customers or generate documents for meetings and organize the content and of presentation. And next, please. And so generative AI will help solve the problem of Japanese society, which will face a major shortage of labor in the super aging society in the future. And people will also re-evaluate uh, re jobs uh, that cannot be replaced by AI that uh, and that require uniquely human skills and communication that I just showed uh, the data. So for example, low paid essential worker jobs should be more respectable and then their working environment should be improved. But however, um, AI could also create new risks of exclusion at just the search, talked about that, like a discrimination caused by AI generated categorization or unemployment by replacing humans with AI or AI divided in equality with gender or ethnicity biased data or AI addiction or and over dependency so on. So chat GPT might give some risks on disinformation, deep fakes and hate campaigns, but due to personalization of generative AI, filtering bubbles caused by limited access to information such as personalized news and the erosion of trust in news and information. And next please. So exclusion from certain social groups could have a chaotic effect on individuals and society in general. So next please. So last year, we had the international agreements on air safety, such as the Hiroshima AI protest in Japan and the uh, Brentsley Declaration in the UK. But I conducted the interviews with young people about their hopes and anxiety of a generative AI. And they are concerned about the small children. So they think uh, there should be an age limit on the use of ChatGPT. But they also said the most important thing is not only regulation on the part of the service providers, but also literacy to deal with the risks themselves. So they think they need a literacy curriculum at school from the early age. OK, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's fascinating. So it seems like, a, well, as AI seems to be going to affect all of us work, right? In the previous two sessions, we already discussed 
how we can use for uh, our UN work and based on our guidelines. So it seems that uh, it is important for everyone, I mean, the children, even ourselves, and how to use AI, but also to consider this uh, this, uh, this cost involved, even the societal cost too. So thank you. Uh, so for the next round, uh, we would like to explore a little bit more on the regional cooperation and partnerships. So to kind of see how Asia Pacific, uh, the governments and the society as a whole, and even the UN or the partners could help to create a future where AI uh, leave us to a more positive future. We can leverage AI for social good too. So I invite a few colleagues from the innovation team as well to ask questions for the panelists. So first I would like to give the word to Rosa, if you'd like to ask a question. Hello everybody. Thank you, Rafael, for calling me. And of course, thank you to our speakers for imparting their wisdom today. So my question goes to Ms. Toshi. So I have a question on the human-centered design for generative AI. And I was wondering, how should the international community work together to create an AI society where human happiness takes center stage? Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosa. So as I told you earlier, so there are differences on uh, both AI narratives and people's attitudes towards AI between the West and Japan. So we must collaborate internationally and intervene with the evidence from children and young people who will become the main users of AI in 2050 or in the future. You know? And without mutual understanding and solidarity, we can never create a future AI society where no one will be left behind. So therefore, I believe we could add some important insights from a point of view of diversity and inclusion, which are relevant to the future AI society. And could you show the slide, the last one, if possible? And the second, yes. So in our UN, a future with air project, we organized two days workshop with young people, policymakers, industry representatives, and European Council and the UN to discuss how to turn the research into action. And the workshop results in some recommendations for the international community, and especially you know, in this uh, event, uh, focus on the coexistence, the last one. So therefore, recommendations. Uh, it depends on the uh, industries or governments or UN. So the first one is um, start an international program of air literacy. So provide air education to all people around the world. Air literacy is the foundation of successful living in a world with AI. And AI education for both young people and adults is important to ensure people have jobs. And we should give kids an understanding of AI from a very early stage, very young stage. And tech companies especially should consider providing free education on AI and robots. And second, provide career advice and reskilling. So governments should provide career advice and support to young people to prepare them for a world with AI. They should provide reskilling for those who need it and use AI as an opportunity to lift people to the next level of their careers. And the third one, employment initiatives. So companies should include employment initiatives in their corporate social responsibility program. So if you are, if you are replacing jobs with AI, how are you improving or creating new opportunities to people? And the last one, so that UN should take a proactive role in advocating for successful coexistence with AI and supporting it with concrete programs. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fushi. Uh, next, I think our colleague Gabby, who would like to ask a question too. Thank you, Rafael, and thank you everyone for this uh, insightful, very insightful conversation. Serge, I have a question to you and building back on, you know, the complexity of the systems of the SDGs. And then what's our role as the UN here? Um, what do you think the role the UN can play in the coming years to ensure that AI can become a catalyst for the achievement of the SDGs? Thank you for your okay. question, Gabriela. So, um, so, yeah, for sure, UN will play a, a pivotal role in, in order to ensure that uh, we can uh, achieve the, the, the SDG agenda and a role in uh, in the global governance, a role in the regulation in order to avoid the harm and, and bias, a role in research also, because we, we have to understand better how we can use AI for social good. 
And as you know, there, there's a lot of ongoing discussion and initiative inside the, the UN system. So there are lots of UN agencies that are involved in, in AI policies and regulations. So you have ITU, UNESCO, WHO, etc. And in the last uh, report of the UNU, UN activities on AI in 2022, I think there was something like 40 UN agencies in, in involved in different um, activities and more than 300 activities uh, inside the UN system. So I think uh, it's not some, the the role of the UN is not new. Uh, it's, uh, at, at the beginning, at the end of 2021, the UNESCO launched the, the first ever global standard on AI uh, on AI ethics uh, framework that was adopted at the end by uh, all the member states uh, in, in November 2021. And uh, more recently, the 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 UN Secretary General launched um, an AI advisory body on 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 and on uh, on the risk and opportunities of international governance on AI. And this is very interesting because it's a multi-stakeholder initiative. So it's something like uh, 32 experts from different uh, regions of the world from government, private sector, civil society. And they already released a, a, a short report at the end of 2023. Or, uh, and uh, the title is Governing AI for Humanity. And normally they, they will uh, provide a, a more final report uh, for the summit of the future in September 2024. And uh, there are also lots of sectoral activities inside the UN system, like WHO, they, they release a report on the, the, the it's not uh, large language models, but uh, large uh, uh, large multi-model <laughs> models. Basically, it's uh, it's large language model that deals with um, uh, different kinds of uh, um, outputs like text, videos, uh, etc. And they have uh, tried to identify the the what are the applications, what are the benefits, what are the challenges in the context of healthcare. So uh, yeah, so there is a lot of ongoing activities inside the, the, the UN system. And uh, I think there is also a need, and I think I already mentioned that uh, there is a need on research, uh, applied research on ethics uh, and multidisciplinary research, not only for computer scientists like me, but also lawyers, social scientists, experts on behavioral science, ethicists, etc. cetera, uh, just to un understand the impact because it's the impact is huge on the world, yeah, the world society and the, so an environment, so we have to understand better that. Yeah, thank you, Serge. And then it's very good to see how many initiatives are around, and also that we are also starting here on SCAP to have this kind of conversation. It's very mm. timely. Uh, next, I'd like to invite my colleague Caio to ask also a question. Yeah, thanks, Rafael, and thank you very much, speakers. This is all fascinating. I'm personally learning a lot today. So my question is to Pratya regarding AI policies. Uh, Pratya, yes. what role do you think that international organizations like the UN should play in supporting governments in the Asia-Pacific region in the adoption and implementation of AI policies? Okay, thank you for the question. This is very interesting. I think the UN and other international organizations definitely play a crucial role in supporting local governments to adopt and implementing um, AI policies. For example, UN can play as a crucial missing link between the local governments, those who have the AI policies implemented already, and those who haven't. So you are the missing link. So may I suggest the following actions? for the UN and other international organizations so that we can implement that on other local governments. So first, let's raise AI awareness and promote the roles of AI in boosting a country's economic competitive. So that would be the magnet for the local governments. The second part, we should enable and support the knowledge sharing sessions for, for example, for moderate and deep knowledge of AI among the policymakers. I'm not talking about researchers, but for the policymakers. We should also promote ethical uses of AI in local governments in Asia Pacific region. So ethical uses of AI would be the key thing. And um, regarding the people, like government agency people, the major scaring part is the upskilling and reskilling those people. So not only adopting the AI technologies, but also reskilling and upskilling them too. We should also suggest the local government to refrain from introducing any other obstacles or hindrance to the current AI ecosystem. 
they should already have one. Don't introduce any more regulations. Just let them flow. And the last one, the UN and other international organizations should act as a magnet. You already are a magnet. You should bridge the local governments to the techn technology giants so that they can have a chat and implement AI workflows for their government. So this is my suggestion. Thank you. That's Thank excellent. You, Thank you so much, Rafael. Over to you. Yeah, very, very good point. I think it's starting to raise awareness and this knowledge sharing. That's always a, a good first step for us. And I think uh, this session here is already one key example as colleagues from the UN to start to thinking about it and then spreading out to policymakers. Maybe we can share this uh, recording with some policymakers too. Uh, so finally, uh, we'd like to ask Vikas to ask a question too. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My question is to Kun Kasima on the benefits of uh, generating AI, which you briefly touched upon. Um, so how could governments from the global south uh, potentially work together at a regional level to ensure, let's say, better or more equitable access and uh, distribution of the benefits that uh, Generate AI provides? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vikas. Uh, so I, I'm a software engineer, so I think about it from, from a product engineering standpoint. And uh, in, in the software world, you know, we think about localization in, in two parts. We think the first half of how we think about it is something we call internationalization. That means getting something ready to be localized. And then we go into a localization phase, right? Um, and so when we look at it from how regional, at a regional level, governments, research institutions, even private sector can, can collaborate together, um, I think about it at that first level, at the internationalization level. And so from a government standpoint, you can look at policy and funding to collaborate at that level. And because in a lot of ways, this is a technology race, um, the smaller economies um, are going to have to start to work together to really keep up. It's not even to get ahead, right? And so you got to think about in terms of like sharing resources to work on foundational models, sharing compute, sharing data, sharing research. Um, another thing to, to think about is, is sort of pushing and funding research in the direction of this kind of work. And so um, in the NLP world, uh, this kind of work is, is called like, for instance, Thai is considered a, a low resource language, right? We don't have enough data or tooling um, to really do sophisticated NLP. Uh, we're, we're for sure not at the bottom of the list, you know, out of the 150 something global languages that are recognized or perhaps more, um, they're, they're, most of us are in the low resource or in the low, low resource area. So, so funding research in that direction and also in the research of, of studying cultural bias, right? And so as we look into, um, as we talk to companies in the West, especially companies in the US, uh, this is not on the radar, which is actually not surprising at all. Um, so it's, it's kind of up to us to sort of look at, look at, uh, highlight and look at research that pushes in, the, in this direction. For instance, we're, we're working with Stanford University to develop a cultural bias evaluation um, that is specifically for Thai, but that cultural bias evaluation can be applied across all cultures once we have sort of a framework in place. This is the kind of research uh, that I think would be helpful for, for both governments and, and private, private, private uh, industry to sort of push at. Um, and, and one thing I want to just note also, uh, um, in, in the original uh, phrasing of the question, we were talking about the Global South and how we can work together as a Global South. And I, what I want to highlight is perhaps that's not quite the axis uh, to look at. Um, the, the axis is really uh, ultimately primarily English versus everyone else, but maybe broad, on a broader scale, it's really uh, um, maybe the top five languages in the world versus, versus everyone else. So there's actually a, a lot of opportunity. You know, on the one side, it seems very daunting. On the other side, there's actually a lot of opportunity uh, for, for, for people to come together and collaborate on this issue. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kasima. I think, wow, we have like so many different angles to think about it. So now I think it's a good time to open for the Q&A. Uh, so we have a few six minutes, but if there's enough questions, we can keep, we talk with the panelists and we can go for 1.15. So uh, let's open for the Q&A now. I see Hongji Chi in the chat. Would you like to ask your question or should I read it? Otherwise, the first question here we have is on um, a quick question for Professor Toshi. What happens when we use Japanese to test AIs? How is the language influx that? You're muted, by the way. 
<laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry about this. So, for example, when we use the chat GPT, um, we ask the same question and in Japanese. The answer is just one, one, uh, only one point, but in English, maybe 10 point to answer that. So it's a quite a uh, different uh, Japanese version, chat, even ChatGPT Japanese version and the uh, English version. So now Japanese government uh, tries to invest, uh, encourage Japanese uh, companies and universities to develop uh, generative AI based on Japanese languages. So because people were also concerned about the uh, privacy uh, data things, so they like to um, limit uh, data in Japan. In Japan, inside of Japan, so and not not you know Google or you know X or Instagram or in the US based and TikTok very popular in Japan but in the China based and then Line is a uh, Korean. There is no uh, Japanese uh, major SNS or major um, AI kind of system. So now really really uh, Japanese government want to uh, develop uh, investigate. Uh, AI industries. Thank you. Uh, a next question we have is if AI only works well in English, uh, if so, would it be reasonable to predict that disparity will become bigger and bigger? If so, what the UN should do? I think it kind of relates with uh, Kasima, but I imagine all panelists might have a different thought. So uh, anyone would like to respond to this one? I'm happy to chime in. Um, yeah, I mean, this question nails it. Right. Uh, this is exactly what the issue is, and uh, there there is work that is that is pushing against it. You know, uh, Surge just dropped in. There there are actually plenty of multilingual models um, out there as well. That and and that line keeps moving, um, and so so hopefully hopefully the disparity will not get bigger and bigger as we all work on it. But um, what what role can the UN play? I think this. Is a great this is a great uh, thing for the UN to do. Uh, highlight these issues. Um, ultimately, I, when I look at, at at the phase we're coming in with this technology, it's really an institutional technology, right? We're 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 talking about there's no one in a garage somewhere in Palo Alto uh, with 500 GPUs spending millions of dollars creating these models. You know, they're coming from institutions like Google and. Facebook and Microsoft, right? These these large these large organizations, and the UN is a large organization that pushes the other direction, right? The UN has has a global purview in a way that a lot of these companies do not, um, and so so I think I think highlighting these issues, pushing pushing the importance of sort of multilingual, multicultural um, capability. Uh, from from the platform that the UN has and from the reach that the UN has, uh, I think I think would would be in, immensely helpful. Because um, on the other side, you know, someone someone just uh, you know a person who on Twitter who is excited about these problems aren't going to get the same kind of recognition uh, from you know someone at OpenAI, right? But the UN can. So mm -hmm. so that's what I would say about about the UN's potential role here. Thank you, Kasim. Uh, Serge, maybe you like to ship in soon. I also see you put something in the chat. Yeah, I just mentioned this uh, this uh, blue model that was uh, made in in Europe um, uh, a few a few months ago with a multilingual model. So I know that there are also other initiatives in Africa to to uh, try to have models for different uh, uh, languages. So there are initiatives for sure. But yeah, as we already mentioned, it's. Uh, it's uh, yeah. It, it takes a lot of uh, uh, resources to build this model, so it's uh, so it's uh, not something that you can do in your garage, yeah, for sure. It's mm -hmm. uh, so the UN might play a role. I don't know exactly what what role we can play, but uh, we are. I know that there are already some kinds of discussions among us to try to see if we can uh, uh, move in that direction. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we still have to discuss. Yeah. Thank you. And perhaps related to that, a question to Pratya: Is the is Thailand also looking a little bit on a regional angle in collaboration, so far as establishing the foundations first? Yes, um, we are looking forward to establishing um, regional collaborations, not only just in Thailand but also in Southeast Asia. So we try to establish a network of um, generative AI um, research. Um, basically, we have a collaboration with all the. Uh, I mean some member universities um, in Southeast Asia 
for example, in Singapore and also in Indonesia and also in Malaysia. So um, we have developed a project before. So um, it's called machine translation for ASEAN languages, and that could also be used for a bridging the disparity of translation in this um, in this um, generative AI era. That was a while ago. So um, allow me to also address the problem um, that um, Professor here, yeah, Xia Hongyi has uh, introduced. I think there are two solutions: the the short term one and the long term. The short term one is actually using the machine translation for translating um, from local languages into English and then unleash the full capacity of generative AI. So that would be the short term solution. But the long term solution that UN can play an important part is to, to leverage the education in the region. OK, so we have to also raise the English proficiency for the local people and also and um, encourage the AI awareness to them so that they can release the full capacity of the AI. But the second part is about the AI technology itself. Now we have the knowledge distillation. We, when we can transfer the knowledge from larger model into smaller model while keeping some, some um, let's say downstream tasks or smaller tasks as good as the, the larger one, things like that. So um, in the long term, in the long run, we can, still um, abridge the disparity of translation by either technologically or by the support of the UN. Perfect. Thank you so much, Pratya. Uh, any other questions in the chat or colleagues would like to raise their hands? I'll give you a few minutes here. Two seconds. All right. Uh, perhaps one more quick question here is in terms of like access. So, as we mentioned about the, the, the technology and the transition, but also one quick point is these models are quite expensive to access, right? And one point that I raised in the pre previous ones is a, a, pl a, pl a plus license costs $20. Who has the resources to use this technology? I wonder if anyone has some reflection on the matter of accessibility to these languages. Even if you have a Thai language model that is very available, how is the access to that model going to be? Oops. Any of the panelists otherwise? Archer, would you have any reflection on that since you'll be working with the government? Yes, um, I do have some reflections on that. So uh, my motto is quite clear, the more the merrier. So the more models available, the merrier we are as a researcher and also as a developer. So as a developer, we can have more choices to try. So these language models are available out there on Hacking Face, for example, and we can um, let's say utilize them in our project so we can try all and if it were um, apply for a token for example so that we can unleash the full capacity of that that large language model um, that also include the commercial one like with GPT-4 and um, Microsoft Copilot we also um, attempt to do that as well so this is my reflection thank you and I want to surge if you also have some reflection as well from this more developmental side of the, the potential mm. generative AI. Serge? Um, yeah, I think uh, we, we already mentioned that, but uh, for sure, if you want to build the, the foundational models, it's, it's very costly. But today is always, always this uh, possibility also to fine tune existing model. And this is why open source models are, are, are really important because you can you can maybe consortium of uh, universities and, and private sector, they can build this foundation, foundational model. And after that, you can download it and fine tune. Uh, and this is, it, you, you need less comp computational resources to do that. So you can fine tune it to your specific needs. I don't know if you are looking to, to use your models to do, I don't know, something specific about your, your your domain, you can you can do it more easily. So I, I think this is the way for for, for people to to uh, to uh, save some money when 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 using this kind of tool. Yeah, but uh, yeah, for sure, there is a uh, this kind of the, the the access right now is uh, is difficult. Uh, I know that for Macau, for example, in Macau, we are not able to access uh, the ChatGPT not because of uh, because we are in China, but because OpenAI uh, blocked ChatGPT Chat for for Macau and Hong Kong. So it's uh, so you have also this kind of accessibility issues that you we, we have to think about. 
Perfect. Well, thank you so much, colleagues. I think, uh, thank you very much, panelists. Uh, in this very short amount of time, I hope we could uh, get you to think in how these different many dimensions can, to think about generative AI and how it can impact uh, our future work in uh, the region of Asia, the Pacific. So with that, I'd like to give to Rosa to close off the session. And thank you again for the panelists and thank you very much. Rosa, over to you. Thank you for that, Rafael. Also, thank you so much to our panelists for this really thought-provoking discussion. Hopefully, based on what we've talked about today, colleagues will hallucinate less about what our future will look like, how Asia Pacific, how the work, how our, how ASCAP's work will look like, and also the region. So again, thank you, and also thank you to my colleagues and all the other teams that made this lab possible. And finally, of course, to all the ASCAP colleagues here in the room today. This lab would not be possible without you. So thank you so much for joining us on this learning journey. But before we can really formally close the session, we'd like to send, uh, sorry, to say a few closing messages. So first of all, number one, we hope to do better in our future labs, of course. But to do that, we need your help. We need to hear it from you on how we can improve. So please rate our session and tell us how we can improve. We will be adding our feedback form in the chat later on. And finally, if you're facing any work challenges, why don't we do a lab to solve it together, right? So if you have a topic in mind that you want us to cover, please send your suggestions on our Padlet by either scanning the QR code or clicking the link on the chat, which will be shared later on. You may also email us at scap-innovation at un.org. Our doors are always, always open for any work challenges. Nothing can be impossible to solve as long as you do it together. And with that, we're finally closing the session. That is really all for Express Your Creativity. This marks the end of the series. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you in the next Innovation Labs. Have a good day, colleagues. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye-bye.